Wouldn't life be simpler if everything fell into the category of one and done? Just do it one time and it's done. Think about it. Cleaning house. <laughs> Ladies, raise your hands and say yes. Washing dishes. Putting gas in the car. Wouldn't it be nice if, it only, if you only had to tell your kids to stop fighting one time? It would be nice that way if we only had to do it once and it would never have to be repeated. What would it be like to only say one time, please get the mud off your boots before you come into the house? Yeah, that ain't going to happen. <laughs> That's not the way life works. We eat more than once in our lifetime. We breathe more than once. We sleep more than once. Most of life is about repetition. We repeat the doing of things out of necessity. There's not much we do which lasts forever. Now when the Jews were first given their order of worship, everything had to be repeated. Much of it was repeated on a daily basis, some of it on a weekly basis, others on a yearly basis, and there was even one that was repeated every 50 years. Okay. But repetition was a part of their worship. It was required in their law. However, a change came with the coming of Jesus. As we read this morning, from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 5 through 10, Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. When he said above, You have neither desire nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. Then he added, Behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Now the writer of Hebrews starts out this section with a quote from Psalm 40, which is one of David's psalms. Now David was king under the old law with its forms of worship. Those forms of worship had been clearly prescribed for the Jews when they came out of Egypt. Yet David says that these things were not required. Hmm. That's interesting all by itself. But if you think about it, you, you, you know that that statement of David's had to come by revelation because it was not written down in Scripture. So he was able to understand something that was not plainly written. There's a lesson in that for us. Not that we go outside or away from the Bible, but that we need to be open to what the Holy Spirit may bring into our lives. I'm not going to deal with that today because we'll save it for another day, though I've, I have mentioned this before, and I keep saying we'll talk about it. We will, someday. What I want us to focus on this morning, though, is the change from having to repeat everything on a regular basis to the one and done reality of the new covenant brought by Jesus Christ. There's a reality there that we need to look at. He says, and by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Once for all. What does that mean? We touched on this a few weeks ago when we compared what Jesus has done in the new covenant to what was required in the old. And if you didn't get that, that was in the message entitled, How Much More? And for those of you online, you can find that on my website or through the podcast, or on YouTube. Some of this, then, this morning, is going to be in the way of review. But 
That's, I don't see that as a problem since I find over and over again in the scripture, I want to bring this to your remembrance, I want to bring this to your remembrance. And as an educator, I also discovered that one and done is not how something works for learning. Okay? It takes repetition. So let's recall what we said about once for all from our previous lesson. We were trying to understand what could it apply to. It could mean for all time, once for all time, which means that it's never to be done again. It could also mean that it was once for all Jews, because we were reading in Hebrews, which was written to the Jews. It could also mean it was once for all people. Now these are each a possibility, and at least one of these possibilities should be true. At least one of them. In this verse, we see that the offering of Jesus was a one and done event. We have no problem believing that part of the verse. That's, that's easy for us to accept. We know that there's no need for Jesus to ever face the agony of the cross again. As it says in Romans chapter 6 and verse 9, <clears throat> we know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. However, the very next verse takes us into another realm for consideration. You know, I've told you before, got to get the context. So let's go just a little bit further into verse 10. It says, for the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Now this verse adds something beyond just the simple idea of conquering death. In his death, he died to sin. Think about that. Jesus, the death that he died, he died to sin. Now this is a concept that can't, we can't simply just read it and gloss over it and get on past it because we'll definitely get confused. So, but I'm going to ask you a question. Was Jesus a sinner? No, we know that he wasn't. That comes close to being a stupid question, I know. Because obviously not. We know, though, from the scripture that he was tempted like any other ordinary man, but he did not sin. We find that in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15 where it says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. So what does Romans 6.10 mean when we read that Jesus died to sin? Like I said, if you consider it by itself, just thinking that Jesus died to sin without any, taking anything else, I believe you'll get stuck. It just doesn't make any sense. It's not until we begin to consider what is added to that thought that you can begin to make sense out of it. It wasn't just that he died to sin. He died to sin once for all. That's where we can pick up and begin to make sense. Because we've tried to consider the possibilities of all. All Jews, all time, all people. The only conclusion that makes any sense is that he died to sin once for all so that no one ever dies for sin again. There's nothing else that makes sense to me in that. Now this sense becomes obvious when we consider the next verse in Romans. Staying within the context, verse 11 says, So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. We should reckon ourselves dead to sin because of what Jesus has done. But think about what we've been taught over the years. Have we not been taught to consider our sins? To think about our sin? We've been led to believe that we should focus on our sin and our sinfulness. But once again, in that place, we are faced with a dilemma. The human condition, as I've told you before, is only capable of one emotional focus at a time. Therefore, we're either to focus on our sin or our death to sin. We can't focus on both of them. We either focus on our sin or the fact that we're dead to sin. We cannot have both. Personally, I prefer the plain statement of Scripture that, that's used here rather than the man-made interpretations of other verses. 
which is when you stop and think about it, if you just read the scripture without what we've been taught, you'll find out there's a lot of interpretation that goes on there. Because the man-made interpretations tell us that even though I have been born again by the incorruptible word of God, yet I am still a sinner and will always be one. But Paul puts the lie to that teaching in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17 where he writes, Therefore, if anyone is in, new, is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. What was the old? Okay, that was in Adam. That was sin. The new has come. We're not what we were. While Paul may have referred to his life in the past, he never referred to himself as a murderer or a persecutor. I persecuted, but we interpret that to say he was a persecutor. No, that's what he no longer is. That's what he was. Unfortunately, though, reckoning ourselves dead to sin does not fall under the one and done category. We must continually... It's a continual reckoning until it becomes a reality in your mind and life. Now that word says consider yourselves dead to sin or reckon yourself dead to sin is the same word that's used in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8 where we're told what we should be thinking about. When it says think on these things, that word consider. So is it just a one and done? Obviously not. Philippians 4 8 says finally brothers, whatever is true, Whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. It means, that word think means bring your mind to bear, not just have thoughts passing through that come in this way and go out that way. You say, what was I thinking about? No, bring your mind. It is, it is a forceful activity of the mind. But let me ask you a question. Is that what your mind is usually bringing to your awareness? For most of us, we'd have to say no. It's not the kind of thing that we think about for the most part. More often than not, we're thinking about the condition of the world, the condition of society, the condition of those around us. Right? Isn't that where we are? So this idea of what we're supposed to think about is something that we have to, if I can use the, the concept, train ourselves to do. Where we become what I call mindful about worth, of what we're thinking about. Because it's just so easy when we get something going in our mind to just let it continue. And when those things are negative, it takes us into a downward spiral. Never any pleasurable event or result, I guess is the word I'm looking for. So as I wrap this up, I want us to consider one more verse about the concept of one and done in the death of Jesus. In chapter 7 and verse 27 of Hebrews, he says, He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. Now, the old order of worship required a daily offering of sacrifices for sin. But as we saw at the beginning of this with our opening scripture, he does away with the first in order to establish the second. The daily offerings were done away with in Christ, never to be repeated. He died once for all. He died for everyone. He died for you. He died for me. He died to all sin. Your sin and my sin. Certainly not his sin, as we've already said. As a result, you can consider yourself dead to sin. And we know that where the thought, where the energy goes of your mind is what shows up in your life. Okay? That's where you go. So where's your focus? If you can learn to consider yourself dead to sin, 
will that not become a reality in your life? At least for longer than 60 seconds. We had a challenge in our last Bible study about someone who said we will always sin. And I asked a simple question. Can you go 60 seconds without sin? Well, yeah. Well, can you go five minutes without sin? Yeah. Can you go a whole day? Whoa, we put the brakes on there, don't we? Can't go a whole day. Why not? Consider yourself dead to sin, and the more you do so, the more free you will become. It is that sin consciousness that keeps us bound up, keeps us from moving forward in the freedom that we have in Christ. That's what Paul's whole letter to the Galatians was about, and he sums it up there in chapter 5 and verse 1, where he says it was for freedom that Christ has set you free. He's referring specifically to the law, but then he also teaches that the law is what produces sin. We are free from that because all that has been done away with in Christ, and you are in Christ. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I yet live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Galatians 2.20, make it your own.